young Earth creationism is precluded entirely by dozens upon dozens of well-known facts of the natural world. From the radioactive decay law, the speed of light, and the nature of the geologic column, to the statistics that surround common ancestry, the fossil record, and our genetic relationship to the rest of the primates, mammals, and really just the entire tree of life. But so frequently I encounter what I am calling bite-size busts, aspects of STEM fields that entirely preclude young earth creationism that aren't typically talked about, but bust hard nevertheless. Be it geology, anthropology, astronomy, or physics, here we discuss the minutia of fields that leave young earth creationism out in the cold. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe if you like this kind of content, leave a like and maybe a comment, and if you feel like supporting the channel in other ways, you can check out my Patreon, my PayPal, or stores. Today we'll be discussing how one of the most basal organisms on our planet is capable of entirely precluding young earth creationism. They may just be simple nadarians, but I think you'll come to see just how cool coral can be. Coral are marine invertebrates of the phylum Nidaria. They are sessile, meaning they lack a means of locomotion, and come in both solitary and colonial varieties. In non-solitary corals, individuals, or polyps, form massive colonies whose polyps are thus genetically identical. They reproduce primarily sexually, though, and coral colonies will release gametes into the open water simultaneously according to the lunar cycle. Our modern corals are called stony corals, or sclerotinians. So coral reefs are made up of many coral species, both colonial and solitary, all of which grow upward and outward asexually and seed new locations sexually by releasing gametes. In the case of our modern stony corals, their immense skeletons are made up of calcium carbonate in the form of calcite or aragonite, both polymorphs of our old friend limestone. Coral reefs are interesting though due to their nature of growth. As coral reefs proliferate, coral groups die and are replaced by new polyps. This leads to a continuous growth of new coral colonies on the dead skeletons of their colonial forebearers. In fact, the largest reefs on our planet are living coral groups on thousands of years of dead coral groups, and this includes the Great Barrier Reef. The first type of coral that we're going to be discussing today are the stony corals, or sclerictinians, which build these broad, shallow water reefs. Now, sclerictinians also build fringing reefs, classic coral reefs, barrier reefs, and atolls, the majority of which occur in tropical and subtropical seas. This is because these particular corals are not only incredibly common, but are of interest thanks to their abysmally slow growth rates, adding an average of 0.2 to 1.0 inches per year to the overall height of the reef. According to this same source, corals have an ideal growing condition that appears to apply generally across the board. Quote, coral reefs grow best in warm water, 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 to 29 degrees Celsius. They prefer clear and shallow water where lots of sunlight filters down to their symbiotic algae. It is possible to find corals at depths of up to 300 feet or 91 meters, but reef building corals grow poorly below 60 to 90 feet or 18 to 27 meters. Corals need salt water to survive, so they grow poorly near river openings or coastal areas with excessive runoff." Unquote. I imagine the problem is growing clear, much like coral do in calm, clear, shallow waters that are warm. I'm so happy, oh, happy, very lucky me. I just go my way, living every day. I don't worry, worries don't agree. Things that bother you never bother me. Things that bother you never bother me. I feel happy and fine, ha ha. Living in the sunlight, loving in the moonlight, having a wonderful time. Having got a lot, I don't need a lot, coffee's only a dime. We're living in the sunlight, loving in the moonlight, having a wonderful time. 
as we all know, young Earth creationism requires a spontaneous creation event some 6,000 years ago, as well as a global flood event some 4,400 years ago that is responsible for all layers of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, as well as their fossils, every impact event or mass extinction signature within said layers, the current positioning of the continents, the state of decay of all radioactive elements, and finally, the various levels of diversity for all extant life. This makes corals incredibly problematic for creationists then, as they have 4,400 years to explain not only the incredibly tall coral reefs in existence today, but also preserved reefs of enormous size. There simply isn't enough time for modern sclerotinians to grow to their current size in the 4,400 years of the post-flood world, nor is there enough time for preserved reefs to reach their form in a mere 1,600 years prior to the flood. You can imagine that the response to the abysmally slow growth rates seen by both extinct and extant corals is simply an invocation that they just actually can grow way faster than anything we've ever observed in either major groups. It doesn't matter which kind of coral we're looking at though, because today we're going to be examining the modern sclerotinians, the extinct rugos, and the extinct tabulates, and what we're going to find is that we can take the absolute upper bound of growth rates for, for any of them, and we don't even come close to reaching the growth that we see in both preserved extinct reefs and in modern reefs that we watch day to day. You simply cannot get growth rates that will mesh with the Young Earth Creationist timescale. 6,000 years isn't enough to get the size of the reefs that we observe. So let's begin with the modern Sclerotinians and the Enuitok Atoll. This atoll was cored many decades ago and indicated that it is an enormous coral reef growing on a volcanic rock. As that volcanic rock sunk, as some do, the coral was forced to grow upwards in order to maintain proper conditions. This is similar to how trees grow towards sunlight, and it created a massive slab of coral around 1,380 meters thick, nearly a mile. The deepest parts were so old that the aragonite skeletons of the coral were geochemically converted to limestone and then to dolomite. But let's give creationists the best possible scenario and assume that all these corals are growing at the fastest known, currently observed coral growth rate of 8 inches per year. To be clear, we know that these corals abide by the far more conventional and common growth rate of 0.2 to 1 inches per year, but we're being generous. Running the calculations gives us an age of 6,811.2 years, nearly 3,000 years too old to have begun growing after the flood, which is what's required to explain the modern corals, and using the most generous possible growth rate, which is being applied to corals that definitively do not grow that quickly. This is just based off of observation. The more realistic math using these species' actual growth rates gives the atoll a minimum age of 138,000 years, and that is still eliminating any erosional events in the core sample. Coral reefs like Inuitok or the Great Barrier Reef tend to be ignored or they are spun to fit a narrative that coral reefs can and indeed do grow at jaw-droppingly quick rates. But if creationists are citing fast coral growth rates, they must come from somewhere, right? Or is someone fibbing? but accusing someone of dishonesty is a high claim indeed. So let us investigate some of these creationist proposals of hyper-fast reef growth, and we'll see if they are correct, mistaken, or perhaps lying. Most of these super-fast coral growth rates claimed by creationists come from a positively incredible daisy chain of source cribbing, some real grade-A work. John Morris and Andrew Snelling pull from Ariel Roth's 1998 book Origins, linking science and scripture, claiming that coral can grow at rates ranging from a moderate 4 inches or 10 centimeters a year to a mind-bending 17 inches or 43.2 centimeters per year. Thankfully, friends of the channel Jackson Wheat and RJ Downard in their published book The Rocks Were There 
tracked down Roth's source daisy chain all the way to its origins. It turns out that Roth claims the fastest growing species of coral, Acropora cervaconis, has a range of 10.39 to 17 inches per year, or 26.4 to 43.2 centimeters per year, and that he is pulling from a 1968 paper by Lewis et al. titled Comparative Growth Rates of Some Reef Coral in the Caribbean. But curiously, the maximum growth rate that's listed for Acropora is 6.6 .6 inches, or 16.8 centimeters, nearly three times shy of the maximum required for young earth creationism to utilize. It turns out Roth pulled his numbers from a source cited in the secondary data of the Lewis paper that refers to a figure for Jamaica Acropora growth at 26 centimeters, or 10 inches annually. So it appears that Roth, who is cited by modern young earth creationists to this decade, simply plopped the four onto the edge of that 26 centimeter per year number to create 26.4 centimeters, and pulled that 43.2 figure completely out of nowhere, a thin air number. Oh my god! Wow! But Roth appears to be a serial offender, as on a separate occasion he utilized a number of 16 inches per year, or 41.4 centimeters, for coral, which he claims to pull from a 1932 paper titled The Growth Rate at Various Depths of Coral Reefs in the Dutch East Indian Archipelago, by Verstel. The problem is, this paper isn't actually referring to coral growth rates at all. Instead, what it's looking at is the rising, the uplift of a specific reef in the Gulf of Tomini. It is a specific case and an overall assessment of how reefs rise and fall due to tectonic movement beneath these atolls, etc. Uh, this was a part of an overall larger look at how this area of the world and its reefs have changed between the periods of 1890 and 1927. Luckily, an annual growth rate for the coral was included in the paper, and it was calculated to be 3.5 to 5.7 inches per year, or 9 to 14.6 centimeters per year. Just a little bit shy of the numbers claimed by Roth. Another superb galaxy brain citation by Whitmore and Roth comes from their usage of a 2005 piece by Fox titled Rapid Coral Growth on Reef Rehabilitation Treatments in Komodo National Park, Indonesia, where they claim that colonies of Acropora reached diameters of 23 to 31 inches, or 60 to 80 centimeters, in just 4.5 years. Thus, they claim an Uitaka toll could be achieved in a mere 3,240 years. Fits nicely in the Young Earth Creationist timeline, doesn't it? <laughs> Wrong! I hope I don't need to explain that a growth in diameter, where the coral is growing out in multiple directions uh, on an upward top-down look, is indeed quite different from the growth of the height of a reef or of an individual coral, which is unidirectional. It's only growing up towards the sunlight, not in all directions. But even being unreasonably charitable and giving them the aforementioned growth rate, we get a yearly rate of 5.2 to 7 inches or 13.3 to 17.8 centimeters annually. And we talk would thus take 7,868 years using their maximum rate. But then how are they getting that 3,240 years? Because again, they cite Roth's bonkers thin air number of 43 centimeters annually, well over double the rate of the source that they cite. Again, this 43 centimeters annually is allegedly a citation by Roth, but said citation gives a maximum rate of 26 centimeters. Not to mention that an uber-fast growth rate of 26 centimeters per year is still way too slow for the Young Earth Creationist timescale, but it's also not been observed in recent times, perhaps due to the consequences of global climate change. Consider the 2015 paper titled Spatial, Temporal, and Taxonomic Variation in Coral Growth, Implications for Structure and Function of Coral Reef Ecosystems by Pratchett et al. This study places the upper end for coral upward growth at 5.7 inches or 12 centimeters per year, and it is confirmed in a subsequent 2017 study by Anderson et al. titled Variation in Growth Rates of Branching Corals Along Australia's Great Barrier Reef. 
Old Earth Ministries also swoops in to bust Young Earth Creationist authors Snelling and Reed for misrepresentation, or, if you're looking closely, dishonesty. They note that CMI, or Creation Ministries International, claims that a series of the Pandora Reef, which is a portion of the Great Barrier Reef, grows at a rate of 1.53 centimeters per year. Extrapolating this rate and looking at the entire thickness of the Pandora Reef, which is 10 meters thick, the authors claim that it would have taken only 660 years for the reef to grow. They then take this concept and apply it to thicker reefs, up to 180 feet thick they curiously ignore in a wee talk, and claim that they would need less than 3,700 years. This puts their formation at about 500 to 600 years after the Young Earth Creationist Flood of Noah, which many Young Earth Creationists say occurred around 4,200 years ago. So right after the supposed Young Earth Creationist Ice Age after the Flood, this reef started growing. Looks like a nice fit for the Young Earth Creationist theory, I suppose. <laughs> no. Upon closer inspection, we find that CMI decided to use a measurement of the reef's size including only living portions and not the dead reefs that the new organisms are growing on, which means young earth creationism still must also account for all of this in the post-flood growth. The work done by the Reef Research Center clocks the overall size as having required over half a million years to reach its current status using known growth rates, not to mention that the living reefs are also far older than CMI claimed, as they neglected to take into account tectonic plate movement, uplift, sea level change, and climate, which are recorded in the geologic history of the area. The RRC notes that these factors change the rate at which coral can grow due to its influence on sunlight, ocean temperature, and acidity. Thus, the actual known age of the living portion of the coral, as corroborated by various dating methods, is actually 6,000 to 8,000 years old. So to wrap up, the modern corals. The absolute maximum growth rate that we have observed with our own eyes appears to be around 10 inches annually, although this rate has not been observed in quite some time, the last time it being reported being in 1968. But recent studies have placed the maximum current growth rate at somewhere around 5.7 inches annually, um, which is indeed quite shy of what is required by young earth creationists. But Thankfully, we've got Roth, who to this day is cited by modern YECs, who appears to be using a completely made-up number that rounds off to about 17 inches annually. This is absolutely bonkers in order to cram both living and extinct reef growth into this minuscule time period of 4,400 years. This seems like blatant dishonesty to me, because we can't find the numbers that he's using anywhere. No one's been able to suss them out or track them down. And what we certainly do have is an instance of him tacking on an additional number to a, a much lower growth rate that he managed to dredge up. So this is something you're going to have to judge for yourselves, but I think I know where I stand on Roth's representation here. So, of course, what we've learned in this first section of the video is that living reefs are in fact incredibly problematic because they can't fit into a 6,000 year time frame, let alone a 4,400 year time frame. But even more problematic than them is the ancient reefs that have been preserved through time. You know, the reefs that are found in flood layers. Now, geologically, we first see the corals appear in the Cambrian, but it isn't until the Ordovician that they really become iconic. Here we see the rise of the incredibly prolific rugos and tabulate corals. They are represented heavily in the Thornton Reef in Illinois at the Silurian Racing Formation, where ancient reef cavities are filled with thick oil and layering is interspersed. The Devonian Tract in Alberta is similar. These corals no longer exist today as they were wiped out in the Permian, leaving enormous voids in the fossil record. But shortly after, in the Triassic, the Scleractinian corals arrived on the scene and became the dominant type of coral reef that we see today. Now this is really important to note, because it isn't until the extinction of the Rugos and Tabulate corals that we see the Scleractinians in the fossil record. This is around the Permian and early Triassic. 
This is not to say that scleric tinians did not exist before the Triassic, but rather that they were represented by much fewer species due to competition with rugose and tabulate corals. In fact, current molecular data suggests that scleric tinians were out and about deep in the Paleozoic, but that their radiation was choked by the sheer success of the rugose and tabulate species. The shoe would soon be on the other foot, however, as the anoxic conditions that obliterated the rugos and tabulates could not squelch the sclerectinians. But it wouldn't really be until we reach the mid-Triassic that we see the sclerectinians go from this quiet background subsistence to exploding in diversity. Flood geology generally has the first layer of the flood deposits as that which overlays the basement granite of our planet, or layers corresponding to the Precambrian. In the context of the Grand Canyon, this would be the Grand Canyon supergroup as the first set of flood layers. Now, as we mentioned above, Thornton Reef is a Silurian reef, and the Silurian begins some 443 million years ago. This is certainly smack dab in the middle of the flood layers. Thornton Reef is a remarkably intact reef with incredible incredibly preserved brittle tabulate coral heads, crinoid fossils, and other fragile organisms. But it's located in a layer that would have been deposited in the very heat of what is considered by creationists to be the most powerful natural disaster of all time. But somehow we are expected to accept an enormous global flood that instantly buried some organisms and tore others apart, depending on the state of the fossil being examined, that raged for months without burying an enormous reef, and then midway through, covered it instantly, without its earth-shaking power obliterating all the fragile bits. Now, Rugo's corals are slow growers, 0.2 to 0.4 inches per year, or 6 to 12 millimeters, and they make up an enormous tract of land in the Devonian Formation in Alberta. Quote, the Upper Devonian Swan Hills Formation of Beaver Hill Lake Group Koibob Reef is a flat north-south elongate lens at 250 feet thick, 11 miles long, and 3 miles wide, built on the Slave Point Formation, a widespread platform carbonate, unquote. This reef is simply far too large to have formed prior to the flood, during the flood, or in any of the time periods after the flood, even if we give creationists the most liberal estimate from their perspective of 10,000 years to work with from creation to present. The calculated growth rate of these particular coral types leaves the minimum period of time at 15,000 years. Add to this the trouble of the flood wiping out all corals due to their requirements of clear, shallow water and low turbidity. Rugos corals are shown to require these as well, given the shaping of Thornton Reef. Preserved reefs are not shown to have been preserved by any kind of catastrophic process, but by slow growth followed by slow burial. We know this because we know what a fast burial would look like for uber-fragile corals. A 2017 paper documented the Gloria Knoll submarine landslide, perhaps the best modern-ish example of what a global flood would do to reefs. This resulted in mass coral breakage and fragmentation, something not seen in preserved reefs to the degree recorded in the 2017 paper. So Thornton Reef makes for an excellent example of a coral reef that both does not meet the fast requirements for young earth creationist timelines and is far too fragile to have been preserved in its current state by anything catastrophic. Nothing is broken on Thornton Reef, not to the degree that would be required of a catastrophic global flood unmatched by any natural disaster before or since. So sometimes in order to cope with these massive corals that we find that could not have possibly grown within the Young Earth Creationist timescale, we get creationists invoking that these massive ancient coral reefs were actually grown in separate locations, one here, one here, one over there, and that during the flood they were swept up in the currents and ended up all in one big coral pile and then were subsequently buried. Of course, this brings us right back to the problem of fragile corals and other organisms, as well as the orientation of the reef itself. If this reef, Thornton Reef, were carried by strong currents and placed elsewhere, it should be heavy side down. But the heavy part of the reef, the enormous upward growth, is facing as it would if it had never been moved. And so creationists are left with either invoking coral growth rates faster than ever before seen, which is of course not empirical, or suggesting physics-defying currents, which has also never been observed. 
Corals are incredible animals whose appearance, diversification, and persistence in the fossil record aligns not with a sudden creation or a global flood, but with evolutionary theory given the succession of the rugose and tabulate corals by the Scleractinians. Additionally, their growth rates and fragile forms, even at their most generous, preclude the traditional young earth creationist timeline, both in modern reefs and ancient preserved ones. As such, it does seem indeed that coral does preclude young earth creationism. Now, <laughs> responses to this bust will primarily be invoking slander for the actualistic methodologies. Creationists will assert that just because jaw-dropping coral growth rates like the ones invoked by Roth have never been seen before uh, doesn't mean that they didn't happen and that yes, coral did in fact just grow faster in the past. They'll say because we know that creationism is true, they simply had to have. I'll leave that in the air for, for you to assess. Um, now rest assured, Going ahead and asking for them to support these claims, these fast growth rates can indeed occur, will be met with Roth citations, which thanks to the work of Jackson Wheat and R.J. Downard, you can systematically tear to pieces, showing that Roth pulled this number out of a hat, like a cute little fun rabbit, a fraudulent data rabbit, if you will. So my gentle and very modern apes, add this one to the list and join me next time for another bite-sized bust to some big pseudoscience.